Alan and Sandra Parton married in 1983. He had a real cheeky boyish grin and a little glint in his eye. Eight years and two children later, Alan was in a car crash that left him so badly injured he forgot he was married and didn't even recognize Sandra or their children. I don't remember getting married. I, I don't remember my children being born. He wasn't the person that I knew. What's it like living with a wife who seems like a stranger? I didn't like her at all. And how do you stay true to your marriage vows when your husband isn't the man you married? Twice I went to see solicitors to find out about, you know, divorce. But in the depths of their despair, along came an exceptional dog called Endel, who captured the hearts of the nation and helped the Parton family rebuild their lives. This is the story of the dog that saved a marriage. It's, it's really weird. It's almost like someone else's wedding, but with my face in it. It's, it's, it's hard. You, you really can't explain to people. It's, it's almost like a cardboard wedding, in, in a sense, and it's, it's just odd. But that's definitely Sandra. The first 13 years of my life with this woman uh, are not mine to share with her. You know, she shares them with me. But uh, that, that person, that dad, that husband, n never, never came back from the Gulf conflict, uh, sailed away, waved goodbye to them, and, and, and never came back. And uh, just a very angry, bitter, twisted person come back who was broken, who had lost the will to live. And, uh, well... A new life begun. In 1991, while serving in the Gulf, Naval Chief Petty Officer Alan Parton was involved in a car crash which left him badly injured. Alan spent months in hospital as his brain injuries were investigated. The next seven years became a nightmare which brought Sandra and Alan to the brink of bankruptcy, divorce and suicide. This is the story of one family's battle to survive and the dog that transformed their lives. From a young age, Alan Parton had loved the sea. Raised in a council flat in Surrey by a single mum, the Navy offered him an education and a future. Well, he just determined if anybody used to say, you said, and what you're going to be when you grow up, I'm going to be a sailor. There's, there's something about the sea, there's something about that life. You know, it's not for everybody, but, but it was for me. By the time he was 24, Alan had worked his way up the ranks and fallen in love. The first time I saw Alan in his uniform was probably our first real date when he invited me to a cheese and wine function, which was a formal function. Yeah, I think that was probably the time when I thought he's, he's the one to keep hold of. Just months later, Alan proposed. He caught the train from Portsmouth up to Wilton to ask my dad if, if he could marry me. And even though I was 23 or 20, nearly 24, he's, he did it properly. On November the 5th, 1983, Alan and Sandra were married. And he just looked amazing. You know, he'd scrubbed up well, as we say. And even though we had the people you know, we had our friends and family in the church. It was really just like there was just the, the two of us. Within a year, they were a family of three, and by the time Alan was posted to the Gulf in 1991, he was leaving behind a wife and two young children. War is what we practice for, and, and, and I wanted to be part of that. You're not sure what's going to happen. You don't talk about it. You 
almost block it out and I think I sort of blocked it out and almost became quite hard even though inside I, I just it was my way of coping and, and almost seemed as if it didn't matter that he was going away. But changes to naval plans meant Alan's immediate deployment was delayed and so the naval wives were flown out to join their husbands for a week in Malaysia. Alan had upgraded our room so that we had um, something nicer and we had the touches of, you know, the, the flowers in the room. And, and so he was trying to, in his own way, I suppose he was trying to make it romantic, but we still didn't talk about the what ifs, he didn't come back. Caught up in the holiday spirit, Alan and Sandra went to a fortune teller who read their palms. It's difficult to know whether you believe or not, but you know, when I have mine read, he, he said that I would end up with three children and, and, and that my husband would have to watch his head. After a romantic week together, Alan finally left for the Gulf. To Sandra, loving you is knowing that dreams can come true. I miss you with all my heart, except that I really loved the photo of Liam and Zoe. Thank you for giving me two such lovely children. I miss them like mad. Daddy's ship is now slowly sailing down the Red Sea, which is full of sharks. Next stop off the ship is in 10 days' time, and we will be at the Gulf at last. The sooner we are there, the sooner we will get home. All my love, Daddy. It's difficult because the person that I live with now isn't the person in these letters. Um, And it's just quite hard to to go back through and, you know, this is like a, a reminder, really, of what, what I haven't got. I love you so much that it really does upset me to hear that you're unwell. Um, sorry. Only four weeks into Alan's Gulf trip, Sandra got a phone call that would catapult the family into crisis and change all of their lives forever. On the 21st of August, um, I got a call to say that Alan was being readmitted back into hospital and I was really confused because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know he'd been in hospital. I didn't know he'd had an accident. Sandra's husband, Alan, an officer in the Navy, had been injured in a car crash whilst on deployment in the Gulf. For Sandra, speaking to her husband of eight years and the father of their two children was difficult. He was just really distant. Um, although he was speaking to me, it wasn't like the Alan that I knew, and he just kept saying, somebody's taken my clothes. I think that's when the alarm bells really went off, that he didn't... He wasn't the person that I knew, purely because 
he was so worried about everything and he, he wasn't really a panicker. Alan had suffered a brain injury. He was flown back to Hasler Naval Hospital in Portsmouth. When Sandra finally reached his bedside, she made a terrible discovery. It was really quite a shock. He just had this huge graze and, and sort of, well, it was more than a graze, it was, it was a huge graze and a bump on his head. I could just see that Alan didn't, he didn't really recognise me. And I just wanted to get out of there and I thought when, when we get home he'll just go, you know, everything's fine. I, I, I can't remember when the hospitals first said that Sandra was, that this is your wife uh, or whatever. I knew what wife and children was, so it wasn't an, an, an endearing feeling, you know, and it, actually to get out of the hospital, I would have gone home with anyone. And I still had this belief that good night's sleep and he'll be, he'll be Alan tomorrow. And, and he just wasn't. But when visits home didn't make any difference, she tried using photographs to jolt her husband's memory. Because we'd had the holiday in Penang and Alan hadn't seen the pictures, you know, I thought it would be a good chance to show him, you know, I hoped it would sort of spark a, um, an interest. But instead of jogging Alan's memory, the pictures confused Alan even more and made things even worse. He just didn't recognise himself. He was sure that I must have gone on holiday with somebody else and he said I'd had an affair and that made me feel really hurt because... You know, even if he couldn't remember the holiday, he was the person in the picture. Um, but he was so adamant that I had gone off and, and just been disloyal to him. Things went from bad to worse. Sandra became aware that Alan couldn't even remember Zoe and Liam, his own children. He'd always been caring and, you know, his relationship with the children was brilliant. He just couldn't bear to have the children around. He, he didn't like the noise. Um, you know, they, they wanted, you know, their dad was home and usually he came home and he was good fun and he'd build Lego with them or go out on the bicycles and he just wasn't ha going to have any part in, in doing anything with the children at all. I do remember him sort of being sort of grumpy and occasionally he would shout at us and he would never really be... I think when we used to come home from school, I don't think he was particularly pleased to see us. And for me, it was just like he was home. And obviously because he was still physically looked the same, I didn't really know anything was up. You know, he may have even thought, you know, were they his children? I don't know. After five months in hospital, Alan took a turn for the worse. His speech and balance deteriorated. His impaired mobility meant he was now using a wheelchair. I didn't want to be disabled. As a service person, to be disabled is, is, is probably the worst thing. He was moved to the hospital at RAF Routon for ongoing psychiatric assessment. You know, there was sort of mild talk of lead poisoning, depleted uranium, Gulf War syndrome. There was all sorts of other... And again, it was that, God, there's, there's hope. Maybe, maybe this isn't a bang on the head after all and it's something else not connected. But after sort of exhaustive testing, really, they just said it's, there, there are no answers still. Brain injury is the hidden disability. It's not seen, it's not that obvious, um, and people don't look any different in many cases, and yet they are different, they are changed, and, and that's what causes so much stress and, and, and tension for the partner. Gradually, Alan's condition stabilised, and Sandra became hopeful life could return to a kind of normality. There was even talk of him returning to work. This was my hope, shove him back in the Navy, a place he knew, and that this Alan would pop back out the woodwork. But her optimism was short-lived. 
Although he was back at work, it was clear he was no longer the capable and intelligent officer he used to be. He appeared to be coping with everything and he was really pleased to be back at Collingwood, but he was not actually able to function. He had a job copying um, a lot of the work and he would just only ever copy the first line. He thought he'd done really well, but when other people were looking and checking his work, it was even more obvious that he wasn't going to function, really. For Alan, who had been in the Navy for 20 years, it was the ultimate blow. Not even Sandra could have predicted what happened next. I don't know what triggered him to decide he'd just had enough on that day, but um, 